Instruments are the things that enable science. Uh, they are the contrivances, devices, uh, technologies that let us collect data, do experiments, and make measurements. And a magnifying glass is an instrument. The Hubble Space Telescope is an instrument. I'd like to talk to you today about a new instrument um, that is the most exciting thing that I've encountered in a 50-year career in science and that I'm privileged to be a part of. And it's an instrument that's going to let us make pictures of protein molecules in action. So this is a film clip showing a molecule moving. Every part of it is probably somewhat mysterious. And we're going to watch it again later after I tell you a bit about how it works. And I hope it will make um, much more sense. Um, most movies are illuminated by light bulbs or by daylight. In this movie, the frames are defined by incredibly short X-ray pulses that freeze molecules in motion. Um, in most movies, um, the setting is um, normal human space, the actors are people, the props are things like cars, um, burning cars, careening cars, or crashing cars. Um, and in, in these movies, the, uh, the actors are molecules, and the setting is biology. Let's start with the actors. Um, let me remind you for a moment about the chemistry that some of you may have forgotten. Uh, molecules are groups of atoms linked together according to a specific recipe that is um, the same for each type of molecule, but different from one molecule to another. So on your left, um, on the screen, you see three rep representations of the molecule carbon dioxide, two molecules of oxygen, um, one molecule of carbon. Uh, carbon in the middle, two oxygens on the end. Um, this is a more realistic picture that when these atoms stick together, the spheres that they define them merge into a kind of blobby shape. Carbon dioxide is a very small molecule. This is a picture of the antibiotic penicillin. You can see um, quite a few atoms in here. The spheres are smaller than they should be in order for you to be able to see all of them. The yellow atom is, for example, sulfur. It's one we haven't met before. And the drawing underneath is how chemists represent uh, penicillin. And you can imagine how knowing this structure would enable you to try and modify it to evade bacterial defenses against resist for resistance. So it's a very useful kind of chemical knowledge to have. Most of the really big molecules that we know about come from living creatures, um, from biology. And most of those large molecules themselves are proteins. Um, the DNA in our cells contains the blueprints for what the cell is going to do, and it contains the information to make the proteins. But DNA itself doesn't do much. It just sits around directing. Most of the work in our bodies is done by large molecules called proteins. This is one example. This is the protein insulin. This is a, another drawing of the same molecule that shows you that the atoms in insulin are actually arranged along a chain that passes through a convoluted path in space. Um, our bodies make thousands of different kinds of proteins that carry out many functions, from digesting our food um, to transmitting um, the signals from one nerve cell to another. An interesting example is a protein in our bodies called COX-2, whose normal job is to send out little messenger molecules that cause fever and inflammation. The drug aspirin binds to COX-2 and prevents it from making these little messenger molecules in excess, and so it soothes fevers and aches and pains. This picture 
doesn't capture one of the most important aspects of proteins. They move. Um, all proteins move during their functional cycles. Some move a little, but some move a lot. I don't know if I can hold three things in one hand so I can wiggle my finger, but if I wiggle this finger, what underlies it is a large number of tiny little molecular motors, protein molecules that are moving hand over hand inside my cells so that their motions add up to the macroscopic motion of moving a finger. So understanding the motion of protein molecules is really critical to understanding the basics of biology at the most microscopic level. This is how things work. They move. And when we make static pictures, we are underestimating, um, undersampling the knowledge that we need to really understand biological processes. Hitherto, our ability to make movies of proteins in motion has been extremely limited and fragmentary. This new instrument is going to change all that, or so I hope. We um, have talked about the actors a little. Let's talk about the lighting. It's really critical in this movie. So, so this laser pointer, whoops. pure green color that comes from the part of the spectrum that's over here in the rainbow. If I look at a red one, I don't know if you can see this pointer, it comes from the red part of the spectrum over here. Past the edges of this rainbow on both sides are colors that our eyes can't see. So off to the right, beyond the red, are the infrared that we feel is warmth, and beyond that are the many, many different kinds of waves that underlie our communication systems, radio waves and so forth. Past the edge of the rainbow on the other side are the ultraviolet, past the violet, which causes suntan and skin cancer. And beyond that are the regions of X-ray. There are lasers for a lot of these different colors. In fact, the first laser that was ever made was not a visible light laser at all. It was here in the microwave region. And I'm gonna to talk to you about an X-ray laser that's been built at Stanford that is the light source for the movie that you saw at the beginning and that you're going to see at the end again. We use X-rays because the waves in the X-rays um, of this energy that we're using are the size of atoms. And so they let us make images of atomic structures and molecular structures. An ordinary light microscope can't see structures much smaller than a human cell because the wavelength of visible light is about the size of a human cell. If you want to see something much smaller, you have to use a part of the light spectrum that has a shorter wavelength, and that's the X-rays. So in the yin and yang of um, high energy physics. To make small things, you have to spend a lot of money and invest a lot of energy. So this is a part of the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator that used to be a high energy physics facility and that has been repurposed to become an X-ray laser. And the purpose of this mile long uh, set of pipes, a tunnel, is to take tiny bunches of electrons and accelerate them to unbelievably high energies. And at the end of the tunnel, they'll pass through a special array of magnets that I'll show you in the next slide that cause them to turn into X-rays, or to emit X-rays more accurately. So in this slide, the bunches of electrons that I mentioned in the last slide are coming in from the left over here, and they're represented, each bunch of electrons, by this tiny little red dot. There's another one over here. They are passing between an array of magnets where um, the polarity of the magnets alternate. So the gold is north, the turquoise is south, and then they go the other way around. And you may remember that in electric generators, um, magnets push the electrons around to make generators turn. And this is the same force. So this electron pulse, instead of going straight through, follows this oscillatory path. And 
This causes the bunch of electrons to emit X-rays. Um, whenever light is created, it comes about because electrons are being oscillated around in some way. In an ordinary incandescent light bulb, you heat up the filament to a high temperature, the electrons of the filament are jostling around at random in different directions, they emit light, white light. But here, the electrons are following this very uh, regular oscillatory path, and they emit what light of a pure wavelength like the one in a visible light laser. But initially, all the electrons are in random positions, and so the waves they, that they emit don't add up to a lot. As this pulse passes through the array of magnets, it almost magically breaks up into an array of microbunches, where each one of these slices is one wavelength of the emitted light away from the next one. And so the waves they emit are all crest on crest and trough on trough, and so they end up adding up to make a very substantial pulse of X-rays coming out of the front of this like this. These pulses are really spectacular. They are um, unbelievably short. Um, a millionth of a millionth of a second is really short, and these things are 100 times shorter than that. So the technical term is 10 femtoseconds, and if we start with seconds and go down by a factor of 1,000, we have seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, picoseconds, and femtoseconds. That's a lot of factors of 1,000, and that's how short these puppies are. So it's just mind-blowing. Um, so how do we use this pulse in our experiments? Before this machine was built, people were very concerned that the beam would be so short and so powerful, it would blow up the specimens before you could get any information about them. And it almost does, but it works. So here's a wonderful simulation that let the government spend a billion dollars, okay? This is a good computer simulation. So here's a picture of another protein called lysozyme. Again, this is in the computer, not in the real world. And here's an X-ray pulse. And during the X-ray pulse, X-rays are bouncing off this molecule to give us information that will let us make a picture about it. Moments after the pulse ceases, the molecule explodes. So this is um, an operation that destroys the specimen the instant after it's interrogated by the beam to give us a signal. Um, and it's given the nickname diffract before destroy. So here's an example of how we make one frame of this movie. Um, Let's start in the middle. This is a stream of liquid that's carrying along tiny crystals. We use crystals in our experiment because um, they contain a lot of molecules and they, more x-rays will bounce off. This kind of experiment using a sing single molecule is still in the future. Over here vertically is what the slide calls a pump laser. It's nothing but a laser pointer like this that activates the proteins in this crystal. These proteins in the crystal in life detect light, and so you're stimulating them. And then moments later, this X-ray beam, which remember is a sequence of pulses, hits the same crystal and makes a picture of it at a slight time after it was excited by the light ray. So each frame in the movie comes from a different time interval between the X-ray beam and the laser pulse. This is a blown up version of the experiment. Here's the laser beam coming in. Again, it's a stream of pulses. This is a nozzle that's shooting a stream of, this stream of liquid of crystals across it. And here's the laser, uh, light laser, activating the protein. Going out in these directions are the x-rays that bounce off the crystal to give us our signal. Over here is just a real picture from the X-ray beam line showing how the pump laser glows, uh, creates a glow in the beam of, in the stream of crystals. So now, let's look at this movie again with new eyes. Um, this is the state of the molecule before it started. It's rocking back and forth to give you a sense of 3D. This is the first period. It's up to 100 nanoseconds. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. You can see the molecule is evolving before your eyes. 
and it's imaged by changing the color of the same chemical group as it moves its position. Um, again, the oscillations are to show you, to make clear how it's moving. This is the next time interval. It's 100 nanoseconds to 100 microseconds. A microsecond is a millionth of a second. And you can see the molecule going through its successive motions here, um, gradually fading from one color to the other as the time interval passes. And finally, um, the next frame will be from 100 nanoseconds to 50 milliseconds, 100 microseconds to 50 milliseconds. Um, and you can see these groups have moved quite a lot from their original positions. And finally, the molecule will relax to its initial state um, in yellow, the, uh, the ground state or the state it was in before we started. So this is um, a picture of a protein molecule in motion. And it's a technology that we think we can apply to many, many different kinds of proteins to really understand um, how they respond physiologically during a normal kind of functional cycle. It's a new way of elaborating the motions in biology. I've been in science for 50 years. It's the most exciting thing I've ever been able to do, and I'm grateful for it, and I'm grateful for your attention.